Hi, everyone. Welcome. And thank you so much for joining us for this wonderful event today. We're very excited to finally be able to roll out our pest prevention by design for landscapes guidelines. Uh, some of you may know that this has actually been an event we've been anticipating for a year now. We actually were ready to go um, last April. And then, as you all know, uh, the pandemic happened. And um, about a week before <laughs> we were supposed to have this event, um, everything went into lockdown. So today is a big day for us. <laughs> um, my name is Jen Monet, and I work on the toxics reduction team at the San Francisco Department of Environment. I will be emceeing this event. Um, I want to let you know first that this event is being recorded. And um, to feel free to, to drop your name and your, your title and the industry that you work in in the chat box. Um, hopefully you also see that there's a poll up that is asking for folks' um, backgrounds. It looks like a lot of you, oh, oh gosh. Sorry, the poll just changed. Um, I was gonna give you a little bit of a summary of, of what backgrounds you all have, but I don't see any more, I apologize. Um, anyway, so yes, feel free to also put that information, personal information in the chat to get to know each other. Um, throughout the event, we will be using that chat um, to post useful links, to um, gather your questions uh, during people's presentations, um, because we will be answering questions at the end of this presentation. Um, so feel free as the presentations go along to put those questions in there. And we'll have lots of time for Q&A at the end. Um, I'm gonna go briefly over the agenda. So first we will have two welcome speakers. We're very excited to have Debbie Raphael, the director, director of the Department of Environment joining us, as well as Teresa Martinez, the program manager for Rescape California. Um, I would like to thank in advance the speakers who could be here today who are going to help us roll out this, um, this wonderful guide that we're excited about. And we would also like to extend our appreciation to all the folks who helped make this guide a reality. Um, we have SF Public Utilities Commission deserves a big shout out. They were really uh, important in um, getting this off the ground. And also, you know, Teresa and Rescape for helping us host this event um, without, you know, all the different folks who, who took part in, um, in creating the guidelines and this event, this just wouldn't be a reality. So thank you all. Um, without further ado, to welcome you to this web event, we have Debbie Raphael, the Director of the Department of the Environment, who will say a few words. Debbie. Thanks, Jen. Hello, everyone. I have to say it is so cool to see who is on this call and to see some names that I remember from when I started uh, with the Department of the Environment back in 1999 as the IPM coordinator. And you know who you are, those people who were on the tack with me and working with us to design the IPM program for San Francisco. And you know, what's funny when I was thinking about um, welcoming everyone, uh, I was remarking in, in my mind about how way back then, 22 years ago, and in fact, for as long as I've been working on IPM, which is a lot longer than that, I've heard the complaint from maintenance staff and from gardeners that if only someone had asked them if only those people over there had designed things differently, then their lives would be so much easier and we wouldn't even need all this drama over approved lists of pesticides because their need for herbicides or rodenticides or insecticides would be so much less. And of course, Chris Geiger, my colleague of many years, has heard those same uh, complaints and um, a thinking about how can we do this differently so that in fact landscapes and structures are designed differently to begin with, with pests in mind, with maintenance in mind. And so of course what Chris and his colleagues have already done is do a guidebook on structural prevention by design. And now Michael Bayeski and Chris have put together this phenomenal uh, guide looking at the same idea of preventing out pests, designing out pests on landscape. 
So I think the thing that is most exciting for me when I took a look at what they had done was first of all, the realization that there were so many people involved in putting this together and the working group is very long. So the names of them, so thank you all for your contributions. And secondly, the realization that they had that it's not a one and done. This isn't a, a bound book that's going to be available on people's shelves. This is a living document that is gonna be improved on by everyone who touches it. It'll be improved on from the wisdom and the experience of all the practitioners who want to contribute to this body of work. And what a gift that is to all of us to have a starting point, if you will. So what you're gonna to hear today is just a starting point. Here's the best work we can do so far. How would you improvement, improve it? What would you add to it? What's missing? And so you're gonna hear about the structure of this project. You're gonna see that it's sortable, that it's, um, you can search it, you can sort it. There's different formats. Uh, basically, it's an incredibly flexible experience that recognizes, as both Chris and Michael know because of their lifetime of doing trainings, it recognizes that we all learn and digest material in really different ways. And this is a powerful realization because at the end of the day, if this guidelines, if these set of guidelines aren't useful, if they're not practical, if they don't get adopted widely, then we really haven't achieved the goal that we're all trying to achieve, which is a world that is more sustainable, that uh, supports biodiversity, supports the living creatures, protects human health, and ultimately is in sync with nature. And that just is a call to action for all of us to get our acts together, to take a look at how we design things up front and to pause and ask ourselves, what can we do differently? Who do we bring it to the table so that everyone is contributing? So anyway, just like a wedding, it's really a good idea that you don't sound, send out invitations too soon. If things are gonna change, clearly the pandemic put a big crink in our plans, but it is April again. It is World Landscape Architecture Month again. And so Michael and Chris are coming back to you again, this time virtually instead of in person with a wonderful webinar. So sit back, relax and enjoy what's about to come. I know I'm super excited to uh, hear what they have to say as well as the other speakers who will impart their wisdom to all of us. So thanks for this opportunity to just say hi to all my friends and colleagues and welcome you to this webinar. Thank you, Debbie, for those beautiful, inspiring words. It's fantastic to have someone who's been here since the beginning, who can really you know, share their knowledge and see this uh, program develop as it has. Um, and now we'd like uh, to welcome our friendly organizers um, from Rescape California, Teresa Martinez, the program manager. Um, you may actually know Rescape California by its former name, Bay Area Friendly Landscaping and Gardening Coalition. And this organization has been a very important collaborator in getting this event going. So Teresa. Thank you. Thank you, Jen and um, Chris and everybody for inviting us to join you in this really exciting day. I'm so excited. We, I know that we were talking about it a year ago, so it just makes it really special to be invited back to the table. I'm gonna actually relaunch the polling um, if everybody, I'm sorry, could fill this out again and let us know that um, who's here, um, we'll start again with that. So I know you filled this out one more or one time previously, but I will share results this time. So if everybody could fill it out again. And also, like Jen said, if you're new in the meeting, if you could put down um, your name and where you're from, if you'd like to say hi, so we can see um, all of us who are friends. Um, in the chat and keep in touch with each other. One of the purposes of today's event is also to start a conversation and do some networking between us. And so if you hear of something um, that you wanna hear more about from a speaker or you see an old friend you haven't talked to in a while, please feel free to drop them a message in the chat. Um, so if you could just for five more seconds, if you haven't answered our poll, just let us know who's here. That would be great. 
and I will end the polling and I'm going to um, share the results so that we all know who's here. So it looks like the majority of us are pest control specialists, but we have a little bit of everybody here um, in our training. And it looks like we're really split on who we serve from residential properties to commercials. HOAs are included, parks and uh, restoration sites. That's really exciting. So thank you for doing the poll. Um, I am going to tell you very, very briefly about um, Rescape um, California and why we're here today. Um, just like Jen said, um, we were formerly known as um, Bay Area Landscaping and Gardening Coalition. And um, let's see if you can you see my screen now. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so we were formerly known as Bay Area Landscaping Gardening Coalition, and we were started out of Alameda County, and we are now all over California. We've been in existence for almost two decades. It's hard to believe. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that educates about and advocates for a whole systems approach to landscaping education, workforce development and advocacy addressing earthscaping climate change issues. And our whole systems approach meeting is that we're looking at everything on a landscape from the design perspective, the construction, the maintenance perspective, the life of the landscape and everything that's on it and all of its needs that include water and shelter and food and all of its on-site elements. And we assess all the resources and we bring in the design elements to build on the existing um, resources and help divert, deflect, or convert the site's challenges into even more resources. And so that's why we're just so excited to be here today. Everything that we do is about mitigating the uh, climate change and about changing our earthscape and what we see um, on our planet. And the way that we do that is that we practice our eight principles. And so we have landscape design, construction, and maintenance practices that are aligned with our eight principles. And we do that, um, the practices mitigate the impacts of conventional landscaping, like pollution, uh, water and energy waste, poor plant health, erosion and sedimentation, increased waste. And we really, um, work to not only have a beautiful landscape and design and build it, but also that it is regenerative and it gives back to the, the world. Our practices focus on um, topsoil regeneration, increasing biodiversity, improving the water cycle, enhancing ecosystem services, supporting biosequestration, increasing resilience to climate change, and strengthening the health and vitality of the soil. And we'll learn about all of that um, today um, in our presentations. And our main focus areas are landscape and climate change education, advocacy and policy and workforce development. We train landscape professionals in our eight principles. We educate communities with hands-on workshops such as participating in um, webinars like today. We connect clients with our Rescape Qualified Professional Directory. We facilitate the adoption of landscape ordinances and resolutions, and those are all over California. I'll show you a quick list in a minute. And we create partnerships to advocate for regenerative landscape practices. And so we do this through our programs. Um, our Lighthouse program is our rated landscape program. I'll talk about that in a moment. But our other programs include training and qualification programs, advanced professional seminars and workshops, requalification programs, webinars, legal compliance and policy, community classes, college certification and credits, and educational resources. Just a minute, I'm sorry.
Um, so our rated landscape program is the manifestation of how we best practice our eight principles. And it's a rating system for landscapes that uses a scorecard that recognizes excellence in high performance design, construction, and maintenance. And so we score um, landscapes based on our eight principles and certain practices get more points than others. And um, one of our upcoming projects that we're working on right now is the Presidio, or is the, um, I'm sorry, the Tunnel Tops. The benefits of our landscape program include 30 to 70% maintenance, um, labor savings and maintenance, 50 to 90% water savings, 85 to 95% weed suppression without herbicides, and we can save up to 53 tons of acres of greenhouse gas per acre. So our 14 required practices are here. I'll just leave it up on the screen a little bit so you can get um, a sense of what our required practices are for our rated landscape programs. We do have about 95 rated landscapes in um, the Bay Area and we're working on more. Uh, two of our um, favorite projects are at 25th Street Mini Park in Oakland that received 108 points and at Bishop O'Dowd High School, which received 136 points. And so we do know that um, we feature different um, aspects of those um, 14 required practices at each of our rated landscapes. So it's really cool. Um, and there's a, I'll send, a, I'll put a list of all of our sites in the chat as soon as I'm done talking. Um, and the policies that we work on are listed here. We have, um, landscape ordinances in different cities um, that really um, exemplify the best of our eight principles and our practices. And we're also in um, San Francisco's uh, stormwater permit and in various stormwater technical guidelines. Um, so we are so, really, I can't say how honored we are to be here today and to be a part of this conversation in San Francisco who's doing really great work. And we'd love for you to join us, become a member, um, attend one of our trainings, um, you know, really welcome to our community. And so I'll add more information about how to contact us in the chat. And thank you again, um, Jen and Chris for inviting us to be here today. Thank you so much, Teresa, for hosting us. Um, we really, really appreciate all that you've been doing to help us out. Now, um, I'm really excited to get to the, uh, to the moment where we get to share this tool with you. Chris Geiger of the Department of Environment will be the one who presents it to you. He is the, um, the manager for the City of San Francisco's uh, Integrated Pest Management Program. Chris, take it away. And one of the two, oh, Great. Thank you and so one much. of the two main co-authors of this guide. I'm so sorry. There you go. Now you may take it away. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Thank you, Debbie, for that wonderful intro. And Teresa, I'm so happy that uh, Rescape is, is thriving. Uh, uh, we were involved with that back at the beginning when it was called Bay Friendly Landscaping Coalition. And um, it was a great idea then, and it's still a great idea. So uh, it's great to be, I'm, I'm happy to be working with you still. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you an introduction to the tool that we've been working on uh, and that we've developed, uh, Pest Prevention by Design for Landscapes. And uh, before I get into the meat of it, I'm going to kind of jump back from the specifics to the generalities. Um, hopefully you have noticed that on this planet, we are not alone. Uh, in fact, there are an awful lot of other creatures, organisms on this planet, and we share the planet with them. Uh, we are surrounded by other organisms, and they are fascinating. Every single one is a fascinating one. But sometimes um, we have needs that collide. Sometimes we are in a position where we are competing with other organisms for all sorts of things, whether it's food or space, or even just the aesthetics of a landscape. And this is kind of part of the natural order, but this is also where 
pest management comes in, and it's one of the reasons that I find pest management to be a fascinating topic. It's where we really come most directly in contact with um, competing with other organisms. How do we deal with that is the question. So um, let's see here, sorry. Um, the, um, you know, we, we have a lot of tools at our disposal in the pest management world. And finally, I think, finally, humans are starting to realize that killing is not the only tool we have at our disposal. In the bad old days of pest management, uh, it was kind of like, we've got a spray for that. And that was the, the silver bullet that we all tried to use to solve our problems. We soon realized that there, was, there were very big prices to pay for that approach. And, and so as, as, um, as Debbie mentioned, we came back to the roots of what pest management is and what it means to manage an ecosystem. And at the roots of that is pre prevention. And prevention is uh, something we've talked about a long time, uh, for a long time with the IPM program in San Francisco, as Debbie mentioned also. And uh, we uh, decided to take action on it. Um, and one of the lessons that we soon had there is prevention is not a glorious activity. Uh, not only is it uh, often some things that are really not rocket science, but just very common sense things that we have to do like good sanitation uh, and good infrastructure for sanitation, but also it's very difficult to measure how successful you are at, pre at preventing something that never happened. And this is, this is always going to be a problem with any kind of prevention. Uh, so we pulled together a group. We had a, a Centers for Disease Control grant uh, that we were lucky to receive and uh, pulled together a national level committee, worked for about two years on our first uh, set of guidelines called Pest Prevention by Design for Structures. This is all about what to do in buildings and how to keep the rats out how to keep the cockroaches from thriving, so forth. Um, we were in a position when that was finished to put it into practice in San Francisco's affordable housing and specifically in the, the redo of the San Francisco Housing Authority, the RAD program. And we were able to install pest preventive elements uh, in uh, about 3,500 units of low-income housing in the city. And we are still uh, evaluating uh, what kind of impact that has made. But all, all through this, uh, and, and by the way, that did, that did get picked up quite widely, that set of guidelines uh, and was referenced, it's also referenced in the US Green Building Council's uh, reference guides. But we were also telling ourselves or asking ourselves, what about landscapes? Landscapes are where we live. Landscapes take up a big, a, a increasingly large portion of the Earth's surface area. Here's a little bit of Brazil seen from set by satellite. Here is the same place 20 years later. You can see how humanity is expanding and how big of an impact we're having just on the land. Um, and there are a lot of preventive measures we can take in landscapes to avoid having to use herbicides, avoid having to use uh, rodent, rodent baits, um, and maybe save a lot of labor while we're at it. So we put together another work group. I can't possibly read through all the names. It was, you know who you are and some of you are on this call, I think. Uh, it was a terrific group. This was a labor of love. Unlike the first set of guidelines, uh, which was funded by CDC, this was not. We had, we put a little bit of money into it, but, um, Luckily, we had Michael Bayevsky, who was kind of, although he was our consultant on this, he was really the energy that kept this thing moving. He was so dedicated to this, and you'll hear from him in a few minutes. But uh, Michael and I and this wonderful group of people uh, had a lot of big, deep conversations about uh, pest prevention in landscapes. And I'll just give you the brief history here. Uh, we started off with something called a world cafe, which was, which is kind of like speed dating, uh, but the goal is not to have a date. <laughs> the goal is to 
to really access all the expertise and the ideas in a room. And so everyone's in a room switching tables every 20 minutes. And we generated a lot of terrific um, um, raw material for these guidelines during that World Cafe. Uh, we had a literature review. We did a lot of research on what was out there, uh, assembled a database. And then we started having work group meetings to discuss everything that we had found, review what belonged in the guidelines and what did not, and categorize them. And you know, we had to figure out where is the line between landscapes and structures, where is the line between design and maintenance, uh, a lot of questions to consider. And then finally, we published it. And, and of course, it was a COVID style publication, which takes place one year later. <clears throat> so, a few notes about the product that we have come up with, and it, it is not a static product, as Debbie mentioned, it is intended to be a living document. But this set of guidelines has a landscape emphasis, of course. Um, it's not always easy to draw that line. It's also, and this was a tougher line, it's a design and retrofit emphasis, not a maintenance emphasis. So there are, are, is a bottomless, pit of maintenance programs, maintenance ideas that can be used to prevent pests as well. And uh, we had to figure out where that line was. Um, so the day-by-day -day things we tried to leave out, things that you would work into a retrofit or you know, a re, um, uh, renovating a landscape, we did include, including planning on various systems that you need to have in place to do that. And then finally, these are guidelines and not intended to be any kind of required standards or whatnot because situations are so different with different um, landscapes, with different cases. Uh, these are intended to be guidelines. They're all out there somewhere anyway, but we put them in one place. And that's the idea is you have one place to look for these things. So what I'm going to do now is just give you a quick skim of the, uh, the actual uh, guidelines themselves by chapter, just, just to show you what the chapters are and give you an example of each one. And then I'll show you how it's used. So we have a whole chapter on maintenance plan development, which is part of prevention is having a good plan. It can inclu include things like uh, including maintenance and administrative systems and in infrastructure and physical designs. Um, for example, if you are out there managing parks and going from park to park with the same kind of equipment, you're going to want to have a way to clean off your equipment and get those weed seeds and, and Arctotheca uh, rhizomes off of your, your mowers, for example. We have a section on soils and water, and this is a big section, and basically we're we concentrated on how to use soil and water factors to inform planning. Um, <clears throat> we also uh, looked into how best to manage soils to reduce pest, reduce pest problems in the first place. And I should emphasize that when I talk about pests here, I'm also talking about weeds. We're talking about any organism that humans don't want around. That is the definition of pests that we use. Okay, um, so an example here was uh, um, installing drainage to prevent mosquitoes in low-lying areas, making sure we don't have puddles on the landscape. Okay, uh, we have a chapter on planting design. This is actually a bay-friendly landscape, um, rescape landscape. Um, and the, that chapter includes um, goals such as these, designing with the whole area in mind, prioritizing plant diversity, which usually tends to help us in terms of reducing pest infestation or reducing the impacts. Avoiding invasive plants, of course, and for certain situations, choosing pest resistant plants, whether it's deer resistant or whether it's uh, uh, disease resistant. Um, an example of selecting plants that rats do not love, like ivy. And every time I see ivy now, all I can think of is rats, but ivy is a terrific 
harborage and food source and water source for, for rats and too much ivy is not a great thing. Chapter four is physical barriers. This is what most people think of when they think about prevention. And there are many ways to do this. Um, uh, you put in some sort of fencing or some sort of block blocking uh, barrier. Uh, that's one category of things that are included in this chapter. Also, we talk a lot about mulch and the different kinds of mulches and the different uses of mulches. An example, uh, there are these fancy little um, wire barriers intended for tree wells to keep rodents from digging tunnels everywhere in the tree wells. And if you've been around San Francisco, you might've seen this happening. We have a, a chapter on sanitation. Here is someone at one of the, I believe are the PUC reno, uh, mitigation sites where, where it's really important to get all the weed seeds off your boots or the diseases <laughs> in the case of uh, sudden oak death, get the diseases and weeds off of your boots before you go into the area if you want to have good success with your mitigation project, right, renovation project. So here we have things like pro how to properly screen seeds and nursery stock, um, <clears throat> how to minimize refuse as a pest food source, that's a big one, and how to prevent the import of new pests and diseases. Uh, so example, this is kind of uh, a no-brainer, but having more rodent-proof or mammal-proof dumpsters is super important in reducing um, rodent populations. So that's the, that's the rough outline of the guidelines. Now I'll just tell you a little bit about, about how it's used. We uh, have this available in two forms. For the old school who like to have something they can print out and just put on their front seat of their car and take with them, uh, we have a download that you can print. And this has most everything that's in the second version, which is, well, here's, I'm sorry, here's what the download pages sort of look like. Uh, it has uh, applicability, wh what stage is this applicable to, what kind of pests, details of the recommendation, how it controls pests, what are some trade-offs with other design objectives, what are the applicable landscape types, um, uh, and if there are any products that we have come across, sample products that might address this, <clears throat> we have those included in the, in the uh, guidelines as well, as well as references. So that's the printable, printable version. We also have an online database, which is really the, the most complete way and probably the easiest way to access this information. And that's available on our website. We'll give you the links. Here's kind of what it looks like. Um, You'll, you'll see it looks a little bit like an Excel, a fancy Excel spreadsheet. Um, and there are tabs, one for tactics. That's where you look at the individual um, tactics that we recommend. Um, another one for tools. And here again are when we have found specific tools or materials <clears throat> that apply to a tactic, we uh, provide these as examples, not as a recommendation of the city and county of San Francisco, it's not an endorsement, but these are examples. And we provide all our references to all the source materials we used. Um, when you're in this database, you'll find there are a number of ways to, to use this, to, to do an efficient search. There's also different ways you can look at it. Um, you'll see where it says gallery in the upper left-hand corner. If you click on that, you can change to another view, which makes it look more like a traditional spreadsheet that's organized by chapter. It still has all of the same information, but a different way of looking at it. Whoa, I didn't want to do that quite yet. Um, and, um, and so you will also find that when you're in one of these tactics, and for example, you can't see it here, <clears throat> but if it shows the tools that are available, you can click on that, it will take you to that tool. It will take you to the reference. It's all connected together. There are also various ways in that upper bar that you can filter things or search for things. Um, so I recommend giving this a try. <clears throat> and as Debbie said, it's alive. This is intended 
to be a living document. And that's one of the advantages of having an online database. And so we've developed a way that you, the users, anyone who is, an inter is interested in this topic or experienced in this topic can submit suggested additions or changes to the database. So it really is um, a, a living document. And we're gonna share that link with you in the uh, chat. So check your chat for links. And Jen, if you, you haven't already, if you could paste that in there or I can paste it in a moment. I just did. Um, and really that, that's, what I, that's what I have for you. I, again, I just I wanna give the biggest possible thanks to the working group who put all this, uh, this love into this product. And um, I think at this point, we're, we're gonna have questions at the end, I believe, is that right, Jen? Are we saving questions for the end? Yep, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, so um, we'll have time for that. So thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it back over to you, Jen. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, that was really, really informative. I've already gotten feedback that we have certain folks who are going to be sharing this outside, uh, sharing this webinar outside with their, um, their networks too. So thanks a lot for, for doing that. Um, next, we have a speaker who hails from the San Francisco Presidio Trust. Um, she was actually a member of the working group who helped create this guide, and she is uh, currently the IPM coordinator at the SF Presidio Trust and a real leader in the IPM field in the Bay Area. Um, Krista Conforti, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jen. Thanks. It's, it's so nice to be here with the Department of the Environment. You guys really have helped me. In, I've, I've been working for the Presidio Trust for 20 years, and you 21 years. And the uh, Department of the Environment has been extremely helpful, extremely supportive, and I, and I appreciate all the work that you do. And I'm happy to be here talking today a little bit about um, pest prevention, landscape pest, pre pest prevention in the Presidio of San Francisco. So I'm Krista Conforti, I'm the Integrated Pest Management Coordinator for the Presidio Trust. And in the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna tell you two stories. One of them is kind of like this big sprawling tale with no middle, be no, no beginning, middle or end um, about an attempt at disease prevention, plant disease prevention in the Presidio. And then I'm gonna move on to a more succinct wrong plant for the place story. So two stories coming up from the Presidio. And the first, but before, before I tell you those stories, I just wanna give you a little bit of background about the Presidio, if you're not familiar with it. The Presidio is a 1400 acre uh, park. It's unceded Ohlone Ramatush land. It's a former military base turned urban national park. And I work for the agency that manages uh, most of it. I work for the Presidio Trust. And a big part of our mission is to preserve and protect biodiversity. And uh, to do that, we divide, hmm, you seem unable to move through my slides today. That is unfortunate. Uh -oh. It worked before. Hmm. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing or, um, I'm gonna stop sharing and start sharing again and see if I can make these slides work. Krista, I had the same problem because I was clicking on the Zoom screen instead of the PowerPoint screen. Oh, let's just see. You said you were clicking on the Zoom screen instead of the PowerPoint screen? Um, yeah, that does seem to be my problem. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right, back to the story. In the Presidio of San Francisco, 1,400-acre, uh, unceded Ohlone land, we're an urban national park, and most of what we do is landscape management, and most of what our lofty goals are, are uh, habitat and biodiversity restoration and protection. We divide our land into three management zones. So these areas, these corridors of trees, we call that our forest. I know that sounds funny, but that's our forest. Um, we also have designed landscape zones. We've got a golf course, we've got residential neighborhoods, commercial neighborhoods. So all the landscapes around those buildings and the landscapes that are used for recreation, that's designed landscape zone. 
And then our third zone is our native habitat, native plant community zone. And so those are the areas uh, where we do habitat restoration. And within those areas, we have 16 rare or endangered plant species. And I'm showing you photos here of two of those, um, of those species. We've got the uh, Franciscan manzanita and the raven's manzanita. And for these species, there is only one known wild individual left in the world, and they live in the Presidio. And uh, we have collected seeds and cuttings and we've propagated them. So there's, it's not as if there's only one plant left in the world, but there's only one wild plant left in the world. And so these are, these are pictures of what they look like in the wild, flowering, healthy and happy. And now I'm gonna show you, this is the scary part of my talk. This is what the Raven's Manzanita um, look, it, it crashed five or so years ago. This was really sad and scary for us. This is what we call the mother plant of the Raven's Manzanita. And this, ha this crash happened just as we were starting to take plant disease prevention really seriously in the Presidio. And this plant had a couple of rough years, but then it really crashed after a hot um, summer and fall. And um, we tested it. And does anybody want to guess what they think happened to it? I don't know if I can see chat. If you, if, I'm not going to try to look at the chat while I do this. Anyway, if your guess was Phytophthora, you are correct. We found, we found a number of different pathogens on the plant, but the main driver was found to be Phytophthora, uh, a root-borne Phytophthora. So a lot of us know about Phytophthora remorum, which is the one that causes sudden oak death. This was not Phytophthora remorum. This was Phytophthora pseudocryptogea, its cousin, um, a root-borne Phytophthora. And uh, so this, like I said, we had been spending already a couple of years trying to prevent plant bringing in uh, plant pathogens and then this happened. So it was a real blow. So I'm gonna back up a little bit and kind of tell you what we think happened and uh, what we did about it. So I said, we've got three different management zones in the Presidio. We plant nursery plants into all of them. Uh, this, is, this is volunteers planting in our native plant community zone, staff planting in our design landscape zone, and kids and our forester are planting in our forest zone. And these are all plants that are coming in from nurseries. And so, like I said, two, three years prior to the crash of the um, Raven's Manzanita, we looked at our own nursery and started to try to take um, Phytophthora in particular really seriously within our nursery and we found it in our nursery. And so we got to work really seriously looking at how to, how to get it out and how to prevent it in the future. And we in fact redid our shade house so that we wouldn't have pooling under the, the, the benches um, that Phytophthora could, could move in. Uh, we cleaned out all of our, did a real deep clean of all of our greenhouses. We started sanitizing all of our pots before we reused them. We started pasteurizing our potting mix to, um, to, to kill any Phytophthora that might be in the potting mix. And we did thorough testing, identified lots of plants that were infected with the Phytophthora and we discarded them. So this is a picture of our, some of our staff standing inside of a green debris dumpster, um, discarding plants that our staff and volunteers lovingly grew, right? This was really, really tough uh, for everybody involved, but it was what we had to do to prevent importing Phytophthora into our landscape. Um, so that covers what we did within our own nursery, but our own nursery only grows the plants that we plant into our habitat restoration zone. It, we don't, our in-house nursery does not grow for the forest. There are some exceptions there, but generally doesn't grow trees for a forest and does not grow ornamental plants for our design landscape zone. But all of our three zones are jumbled up and they drain to each other. And, you know, so what are we we're, we're putting in all this work in our own nursery? And are we just going to import Phytophthora from commercial nurseries and, and negate all of that work? So we had to come up with a, um, an approach to trying to prevent accidentally buying Phytophthora from a commercial nursery. 
So I don't expect you to read this flow chart, um, but just to show you that we did come up with a system for um, reducing the risk of importing Phytophthora on commercial nursery plants. And that involved me um, interviewing commercial nursery grow, uh, interviewing the people who run the commercial nurseries, finding out whether or not they have best management practices that match the practices that our own nursery was using. Um, and it turns out none of them did, but a small handful of them did have what we kind of called sort of the must have best management practices. So we identified that small number of nurseries that had those must haves of, of clean management practices. And we said to our project managers, if you buy from those nurseries, you don't have to test your plants for Phytophthora. But if you buy from any other nurseries, you do have to test your plants for Phytophthora. And in most cases, you, they couldn't plant if there were some exceptions. If Phytophthora was found in a few exceptions, we allowed them to be planted. But for the most part, you had to get rid of your plants if Phytophthora was found, or you had to buy from these um, preferred growers. And so we, we lived under that system for through four or five years. And while we were living under that system, we did some quality control on our own projects. And I, again, I don't expect you to read this, all of this data on this slide, but this is just to say that we did try to quality control our system and we did not find that they, we did not find what we wanted to find. We did not find any evidence that we were getting cleaner landscapes in areas where we were using these plants that were purchased under the, this, you know, uh, preferred grower or tested plant system. So this slide used to really hurt my heart. This slide shows a lot of hard work not paying off, but I'm distanced from it now. It doesn't hurt my heart quite as much anymore. Um, and we've actually moved on. We had to change course, uh, right? So it wasn't what we were doing, wasn't buying us what we wanted. And so we changed course to a different prevention system. So over the four or five years that we were doing all of that testing, we compiled a list of what seemed to be kind of regular carriers of Phytophthora. So now we're saying that if you're gonna use any of those regular carriers in your project, you have to test them no matter who grew them and we will not plant any Phytophthora. So that is our current Phytophthora prevention system. And I. Uh, come back to me in three, four years, and I'll tell you how well that one's going. I, I have high hopes that, that, um, that it'll work better than our first attempt, but um, yeah, just, just that, that's, that's uh, IPM, right? You try something, test it, see if it works. If it doesn't work, try something else and continue to, continue to monitor. All right, so that, I, I, one more thing, I, one more thing I want to say about this project is um, that I do can, even though, you know, we didn't get what we wanted with our first try, all that, all those four or five years of doing this work, um, we did a lot of outreach and education. And these are photos of five of the interns that I, the five interns that I had over those five years. And each of these folks, well, actually, sorry, four of these five folks have moved on to, uh, careers within landscape management or plant management or something along these lines. So they are carrying this idea of the importance of prevention through their careers. Um, and, and so I, I consider that a success. And then I also will just point out this graphic here, which one of my interns Azure used to do a wayside to um, educate park users about the role that they can play in preventing um, plant diseases. So, uh, even though it's it's not a, a simple story, I do consider it a success. And then lastly, last point I want to make on this in this story is I, sh I showed you that scary photograph of the Raven's Manzanita looking like it was definitely on its way out. Um, but I just want to show you that it is in fact hanging on. You can see it's, it's, it's got some green growth. It's not, it's not gone yet. Um, but we do think that it was um, importing nursery plants and planting them nearby that led to the introduction of Phytophthora pseudocryptogea. And uh, so while we figure out how to deal with the fact that we were not able to prevent that, um, it is the mother plant is still alive, it's still hanging on. Um, but that's my cautionary tale about what can happen if you don't have the right tools um, for, for disease or, or pest prevention. So that's the end of my cautionary tale. Um, and now I'm gonna move on to my shorter tale, which is a little bit easier to tell. 
this one, switching gears, and I'm now going to talk about um, a wrong plant taken out, right plant put in story um, about street trees. Uh, can anybody guess what species? Oh, sorry, I'll just say this, this picture was taken in the 1930s in the Presidio. It's kind of the front view of one of the hospitals in the Presidio and uh, the army planted street trees. And does anybody know what species tree this is? You, again, I'm not gonna try to check the chat because I might mess something up. But if you guess, I'd, I'd be really surprised if you guessed it correctly because this is what the tree wants to look like. <laughs> it does not look short and rounded like that. It's Acacia melanoxylon, and um, it wants to grow relatively tall and relatively shrubby, right? It doesn't want to be, and it's not norm, doesn't normally look like a lollipop, uh, which is what the army wanted it to look like and spent a lot of time and effort maintaining it to look like a lollipop. Um, so when the, when the Presidio was transitioned from army base to national park, um, the Presidio Trust hired as landscape architects and the landscape architect looked at those trees and, and knew that that was the wrong plant for that place knew that that would that was causing the um the, because it, it, number one acacia is is invasive we actually spent a lot of time trying to control it in our habitat restoration areas also it its root system buckles sidewalks so it causes all sorts of maintenance headaches uh in in that regard and it doesn't want to look like a lollipop so you gotta really you gotta really spend time on maintenance. So this is kind of the wrong plant for the place. Um, and so let's see, I'm going to, I'm going to read the words of our landscape architect. These are not my words. These are his, his, his name is Michael Lamb. And when I asked him for a story of, of switching from, from the wrong plant to the right plant, this is the one he gave me. And these are his words. You really could not come up with a worse tree than acacia melanoxylon for a pruned street tree. Not even getting to the issue of invasiveness, the tree would have grown so fast to need frequent shaping and the roots would no doubt have buckled the adjacent sidewalks. While the US Army was having hard fought success on the world stage, they really blew it at home with this plant selection. Those are his words. <laughs> so what did he do? What did he do to, um, to fix the situation? Well, the acacia came out and uh, he chose a tree that was going to look low and rounded without a lot of maintenance. So he substituted the much better behaved Tristania, which still has that low rounded look um, and the leaf color. This is a black and white photo compared to a color photo, so it's hard, but um, the, the leaves don't, they look very similar, Acacia and Tristania. So the average person's not going to notice a big difference here. No sidewalk buckling, good pest resistance, still get that rounded structure. And um, while neither tree was particularly susceptible to any particular pest, so it's not like there was a drastic reduction in, in need for, for pest management here, I do consider this sort of a, a prevention success in that it reduced a lot of headaches, sidewalk buckling and um, pruning and shows really the benefit of landscape architects thinking about long-term management and, and problem prevention. So that's why I share that story with you guys. And that's all I got. And this is my contact information. If anybody wants to talk to me about Phytophthora, Acacia, or Tristania, or whatever you want, I'm, I'm interested. And that's it for me. Thank you so much, Krista, for presenting um, for your cautionary tales. They, dem they definitely really clearly demonstrate why it's so important to plan ahead and uh, for pests and for invasives when you're, you're landscaping. Um, just a quick reminder that we'll be taking questions after Michael's presentation. So feel free to uh, write those down, jot those down in the chat, or just uh, start brainstorming what you wanna hear more about afterwards. Um, and now I'd love to welcome Michael Bayevsky. Besides being one of the co-creators of this guide, um, he runs an active arborist business and he just received the Department of Pesticide Regulations Integrated Pest Management Innovator Award for Lifetime Achievement. So congratulations, Michael, and thank you for joining us. Oh, you're on mute. Oh. Now I'm on. Thank you very much, Jen. And 
uh, Krista, that was inspiring. I mean, really, Krista, without Krista, we wouldn't have had such a wonderful uh, product in this uh, prevention for design because Krista helped very honestly with all of her experience and was great fun to have on the team. So I want to thank Krista for that, for that work. Uh, I'm going to try to stick to 10 minutes. <clears throat> we'll see how I do. So I chose uh, three of the exciting tactics that uh, we use to try to illustrate how I think this this tool that, that you have available to you can be useful. And uh, Chris didn't really say, although um, I think Debbie alluded to it, one of the main motivators for putting this together was to help the design community. So this is geared for landscape architects, landscape designers, people that design landscapes. It's a really unique focus. I don't think there is any back and forth between the pest management community and the landscape design community. And I think it's very obvious when we deal with some of the pest problems that we're talking about. So I wanted to emphasize that and make sure everybody knows that uh, some of this stuff is not for the landscape contractor. <laughs> it's for the designer. It's for the person that comes in and puts the basic ideas down and, and the detailed ideas too. And we think there's a lot of tactics that we can share as a pest management community that will help you do better design. That's all. And we need feedback and this has to be a feedback loop. So I told, I chose one story, uh, one example from a lifetime of working in integrated pest management and in problem solving in landscapes. And of course it's in the dirt, right? It's got to be in the dirt. This is the hardest subject to teach, the hardest subject to get people excited about. But in a lot of situations, the most important part of designing a landscape from a pest management standpoint. And I'll explain how that works. This is um, touching the soil, smelling the soil, sampling the soil, and learning about what you're going to mess with on a landscape site. So take the next slide and tell you about a little bit more about this project. This is a project that, I'll get a slide someday. This is a project in a public, let's see, a public building on about an acre in a, in a town in the East Bay that I'm not gonna name. And the assignment was to design a new landscape for this public structure. And so the first thing that I did was dig a hole. And I don't see my new slide showing up, so I'll just tell you about the hole. I ran into a handful of shells in the hole. What are shells doing in this landscape? Couldn't understand it. So I had my dear, that was the first one. And then I had my dear friend Richard come out and uh, he's a soil scientist and he does, he digs soil pits. He's dug them all over the Western United States. And we began together to dig soil pits on this, on this property. This is before any design, again. This is prior to design, the first step as far as I'm concerned. I'm not gonna tell you which town it's in because we would get in trouble. Um, no, not really. Uh, digging and digging and digging, layers and layers and layers. And of course, what we found out was we're on a shell mound. This whole public building and the entire acre of landscaping is on a shell mound. Now we didn't find body parts, but we found shells. And nobody asked us to stop. We informed all the authorities and, and we just kept digging and we examined all the properties of the soil to figure out how is this going to influence our design? Well, how's it going to influence your design? Here's a soil that has pockets of shell in it. So there's going to be a chemistry, there's going to be a physical uh, change. How are you going to design, you know, what plants are going to do well here? How are you going to irrigate them? How are you going to get them to live and thrive? When you look around and what's thriving on this site, maybe the next picture shows a little bit of that. Um, oh, this shows the next stage of the soil pit. So we went down six feet. Uh, Dick's about six, five. So he's almost there. And um, if you can see in the background, you can see the, the Algerian ivy, we used to call it. It's now English ivy. 
And uh, most of the site was covered with ivy. There were some walnut trees that were surviving somehow here and there dotted. And then there were some planted bizarre trees I won't even go into. And we dug and we pondered and then I had to come up with a plant list. And so together with another designer, we thought, we calculated what's going to, you know, who's going to deal with this, this kind of uh, landscape. What, what kind of plants are going to work in this setting that's very unique. Now, you may say, well, that's only one in a million projects, but I can point to other projects that have been the same issue. You, you dig a little hole and you don't find anything wrong. You send a sample to a lab and it comes back add a little amendment and you're done. Well, you're not. And every site has variation. Soil is variable and needs to be investigated thoroughly. So let's see my last slide on that piece, I think. Yeah, that's me in the pit. And I'm looking for compaction layers. You jump into a soil pit or you find a road cut. You take a screwdriver and you run it along the, the, the cut face. And when it stops, you're usually going to find a restrictive layer. So how deep are your roots going to go? How deep, how big a plant can you actually install on this site and have it succeed? And if you put in a plant that has a, a shallow uh, root to start with, is it going to die once it hits that restrictive layer, depending on the irrigation or the water? So these are the kinds of things that, that investigating the soil thoroughly before a design uh, can lead you to it and it can hopefully lead you down a nice path. So I want to take the next slide to just move us up to, so testing soils was 2.4 in your guide. When you, when you go to your, uh, your uh, pest prevention by design guide, you'll go to 2.4, look up all the stuff about testing soils. 3.1 is choosing resistant plants. And I really emphasize this aspect of uh, plant selection as a unique contribution of pest management to design. And that is finding plants that are going to resist the site conditions that lead to diseases or lead to uh, other problems that can, can kill the plant. So choosing resistant plants, I won't go into great detail because I notice we have a couple of plant geeks that are listening and they're gonna jump on me if I say the wrong thing. So I'm just gonna back off and say, I chose a plant palette for the uh, public site with a shell mound with great care. And I was looking for something that would tolerate good drainage, that would tolerate very low water use uh, because there's no uh, moisture holding capacity in that soil. And then I was looking for irrigation systems that would at least get the uh, plants started. And how did I look for irrigation systems? Well, that's the next item 3.4 having a participatory design and uh, everybody does this at some level but if Jen can uh, move us up to the next slide this is a fake photo this is not a picture of the participatory design process that I went through on this public project where I made a presentation to the native plant group that was working on restoration of this area which is near a creek and gave them the, my plant palette, and they gave me their plant palette, and we worked together on it. And then I took the whole design to the maintenance staff, handed them the design, and they said, we're not doing that, we're not doing that, we won't plant that, we won't maintain that. And so we modified the design again. And the result is we got buy-in. We got buy-in on a public project, but you can, you can take this down to private projects too. I've done this on small jobs too. And the buy-in was from the maintenance end. And that's what prevented many, many diseases and many plants dying from weed, weeds killing them because the maintenance staff bought into it. The, uh, the volunteer group that was doing the restoration weren't alienated. They were part of that whole process from day one. And so that worked really well also. And to me, having those three pieces and maybe the testing of the soils and the participatory, participatory were the most useful in creating a successful design. And this was a, a much more successful IPM design than some of the previous ones I've done and, and been involved with because 
we hit all the bases uh, from the most physical to the most social. And I think these are the, these are the, uh, the key ingredients in, in having good success in the landscape. So I could talk about these and other things for many hours, but that's about 10 minutes. So I thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. It looks like 36 people at least are showing up and, and interested in some of this stuff. Uh, check it out. This is not my work. This is the work of a great group of people, including public, private, uh, designers, maintainers, everybody across the board doing their best to try to find some real solutions. And, and a big shout out to UCIPM, uh, University of California Integrated Pest Management Program, who has many, many uh, good, um, uh, what we're looking peer reviewed, peer, peer reviewed uh, references. So thanks again. Thank you all. If you contributed, if you didn't, start contributing. We want to hear from you. And um, thank you to Chris. Thank you for Debbie. Thank you to Jen for all your hard work. Thank you so much, Michael. It was really interesting. Um, it's amazing the kinds of landscapes, you know, out there, such a variety. Um, so now I would like to open up uh, our event to, to you all, um, to the audience and ask you to, um, you know, to, to start the conversation. Um, what questions do you have for our presenters? Um, do you have questions about the guide itself? Um, you know, please, uh, either put them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask away. And maybe, um, maybe I'll ask, hey, hey. <laughs> maybe I'll ask the first question um, while I pull up the, the chat box and, um, and get this kind of back to order on my end. Uh, sorry, I'll stop sharing, there we go. Um, I don't see any questions so far. So I'll start asking, um, Michael, how did you prevent weeds in the design that you uh, showed us? Boy, I can't remember. <laughs> I can make something <laughs> up, but I really don't remember. Um, you know, the main thing we were trying, the, one part of the project was really getting rid of the ivy. And so we had about, I participated in at least two or three volunteer blitzes of ripping the ivy out. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, it's a garden that I visit often because it also has a memorial rose garden with my grandmother and another uh, a friend of mine that passed a rose that I planted. And so uh, actually mulch, big time, organic mulch. They, I believe they used the, the, uh, the maintenance gardeners really wanted to use weed fabric everywhere. But I, I kind of uh, tried to get them to restrict it to the pathways. So they used weed fabric underneath the uh, there was decomposed granite pathways here and there, still there. And then uh, yeah, wood, um, wood chip mulch in most of the other areas. But there's also a lot of, there's a lot of volunteer labor going into manual uh, hand weeding on that site because of the, the plants that they use and the volunteer aspect. So I, I hear that uh, a lot of prevention is also necessary. Um like in the design stage? In the design, yeah, in the design, the, pre the prevention aspects that we discussed were really whether or not to use weed fabric, how much, what kind. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't actually, after doing this project, I realized we didn't insist on dense plantings right out of the box. And this is another one of these wonderful debate items that maybe if you guys can talk to Daniel, uh, on Wednesday about that. But uh, yeah, plant dense, plant dense. If you got uh, a, a certain weeds and certain weed pressures, don't plant for the optimum size of the plant if it's not a restoration site. And if you have the money to put it into the plants and maintain them. So that was our, uh, but that was not a strategy that I used on this project. Oh, that is Sorry. actually a really good point you make. Um, so that's another use for this guidebook. Um, that we've published. It's the ability to see a lot of different tactics up front and maybe brainstorm, um, you know, pitting them against each other. Um, right. So thank you, Michael. Um, I don't see any you questions. Know, I can, I can, oh, go ahead. I can chime in. Um, uh, I'll ask a question that was asked a lot, that has been asked a lot in the past, which is about weed fabric itself. You know, what what are the pluses and minuses to using weed fabric? And I really want to pull Michael into this one, especially. But um, I mean, weed fabric, 
if in case you're not familiar with it, it's almost always made of, of a, some sort of plastic material. It's usually a non-woven um, plastic that prevents the weeds from coming up through it. Uh, and uh, it's used to, uh, you know, it, it would make sense as a way to keep weeds down for a longer period of time and not have to uh, do manual weeding or herbicides. And uh, however, there, there is a, a little bit of controversy about when it's appropriate and when it's not. And um, I mean, maybe Michael, if you don't mind, I can, I can tell you what I hear, what I've heard, and you can tell me what you hear. Um, uh, but uh, we've had some, uh, uh, some examples for, I'll give you one example um, of where it was used, where it probably should not have been used. Uh, and that was in a, uh, an installation where uh, there was uh, stone mulch being put on top of weed fabric in a public space. And it's a public space that requires maintenance by public workers. Uh, and you know, you would think you've got it covered there. You've got the, you've got a, um, a mulch of, of some sort and you've got a fabric. Uh, you, you're going to, you're going to keep those weeds down. Well, eventually the weeds find a way. Eventually, uh, even weed fabric gets frayed, gets holes. Um, um, people, you know, landscapes are used and before you knew it, you know, it, it took a while, but there were weeds popping up there, uh, which isn't a big surprise. You always have a few that make it in there, but getting them out was impossible. <laughs> you couldn't pull them out through those rocks and through that fabric. It would, would just break off. You wouldn't get the roots out. And it ended up requiring an herbicide treatment, or I, actually, I'm not sure exactly what happened to that particular site. They might've just redone it, um, but it ended up taking a lot more labor and chemicals than it should have. Uh, and that was a, an example where it was not a good idea. <laughs> um, Michael, do you have any comments on where it might be a good idea? And you're yeah, on mute. I, I think, I think at this point, I'm. Uh, I think it's a good use under paths that aren't concrete. If it's decomposed granite or gravel, uh, or actually areas in landscape that are gravel without plants, uh, because what happens? The weed seeds will rain down and get deposited, and you'll get weeds in between the gravel but they're, they're much easier to manually pull. Now you can't use a hula hoe on them very well if there's plants around for sure and not very well even in gravel, but still under decomposed granite in some cases, certainly they, a lot of specifications are to use geotextile fabric, which is essentially the same thing as a, a weed fabric, just designed to uh, actually spread out the weight and have a more uh, uniform surface to have a path on. So paths and, and big gravel things, I guess, are okay. I, I, uh, I saw a comment in the chat box about uh, using cardboard, um, sheet mulching. That's great. It all decomposes and it, it will require maintenance. Uh, you know, as a design element to design weed fabric or, or I think you also have to say, what's the life of the plants you're putting there? Are you expecting to, to re if you're expecting to replace those plants, uh, in a short period of time, then you're going to have a big maintenance problem. So, so I wouldn't suggest it's a very good place for plants that require uh, replacement, but maybe for uh, perennials, big perennials. Now, here's the other problem with them, however, uh, despite in, in our low rainfall areas where we are in this Bay Area, uh, essentially your wheat fabrics are creating, they're creating layers of soil right underneath the weed fabric. The moisture does not percolate through those weed fabrics in the same way. You end up having compaction layers and your plants are gonna suffer from it. So I, I'm kind of, at this stage, not, not a big fan of their use in planted areas. And I've had some arguments with maintenance people about it, but that's, that's where I stand. Thank you. And I, I'm just curious, Krista, if you have any, if you have any comments on that topic. 
Have you uh, had any run-ins with weed fabric? On, on, on weed fabric? Um, yep. Yeah, no, we, we tend to not use a lot of weed fabric. We do use a lot more mulch, but we're actually trying to move a, a little bit away from mulch as well because we want, we want to increase the chances of ground nesting insects. Um, and when you use a thick mulch, you can't. So it's, it, it's a struggle that we have for sure. And so it does come down to sort of planting density, planting for the right, you know, putting the right number of plants in the place so that when, it's, when they're mature, then you have full coverage. But up until that point, during that grow-in, it's a, it's a real struggle and involves a lot of hand weeding and some herbicide for us. Thank you. Thank you, Krista and Michael. Um, and for sure, so I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say, and for sure, uh, another point against the weed fabric is it is synthetic, it is plastic, it is not going away anytime soon. And after a few years, if you're not really maintaining it, it really looks like a mess. Uh, so, uh, and I think probably we've all seen examples of that. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jen. Oh, no, I just wanted to, to thank you and recognize that um, Daniel Levy's had his hand up for a long time now. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think he wanted to comment on something that Michael may have said earlier uh, or, or add, ask another question. Um, Daniel? Oh, I, I was, was going to comment on the weed fabric um, <laughs> question. I, 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 it's mostly been covered, but as someone who does a lot of maintenance, um, I kind of abhor the stuff. And I think that really the only place it has in, in design is under some um, rock or rock-based mulch applications. I think the point that was brought up originally by, by Chris about weeds getting into it though, goes back to something that's really fundamental to this whole conversation and this whole manual, which is if we don't consider really thoroughly and thoughtfully in a collaborative way, the maintenance of any built landscape from the very beginning, we run into these problems because the truth is that weeding in gravel is, is actually really easy. Um, but like any other kind of weeding, that's provided you can get to it when the weeds are really small because you have a budget and a working plan in your maintenance um, you know, regimen to get out there regularly. Um, and you know, when you're in rock, you can deal with a hoe or with hand weeding very simply. You can deal with flame or infrared heat as an application, again, with smaller weeds, really cost effectively. But again, you, know, you, you have to have planned for it. So um, anyway, that's my two cents on that question. Thank you very much, Daniel, for, for adding that in. Um, I do notice there are also some comments uh, in the chat section. So I know Dolores mentions recycled cardboard and sheet mulching is the best. Um, I think this had to do with how to cover, how to, how to prevent weeds in landscape. Um, we have a question from Sean Hill, who does say, do you recommend covering large areas with weed fabric since it doesn't break down and could be problematic down the road? I'm not a fan, <laughs> in general. <laughs> yeah. I'm more likely was... to recommend, uh, of course, I don't, I don't know if Krista will have to do a study to see if weed fabric and wood chip mulch equally prevent nesting uh, from uh, pollinators, but I suspect that it will, you know, the weed fabric alone will also prevent uh, nesting because they got to dig in the dirt. And just for, just for general knowledge, if you haven't heard of this, a lot of native ground nesting bees, solitary bees especially, um, seek out uh, sand or, or very fine gravel uh, to, to make their nests uh, and uh, to basically bake little, not fine gravel, I shouldn't have said that, sand or clay to make their little holes where they lay the eggs and, and rear their, their larvae. And uh, there is some, uh, some thought now that we should save a few areas for those bees by leaving unmulched areas, we might be able to help. Um, 
support those bee populations, which are, are vital to native plants, especially because they tend to have evolved um, with those native plants. Sometimes they're specific to native plants. Um, and, and so that I just wanted to fill that in since it, it came up. There are other ways to support native bees too, but um, that's one thought that's out there. And I think it sounds like Sean, the answer was no. <laughs> General consensus is uh, no, uh, weed fabric, I, and I, we had a lot of discussion about this. Weed fabric got a lot of thumbs down for a lot of, a lot of purposes in, in our discussions with, with the, the working group. Um, and there is a lot of thumbs up on cardboard. It's temporary, as Michael said, but it gives, gives the new plants a chance to get established and start shading out weeds themselves. Uh, you know, and uh, once that once that has broken down. So let's see, we have any other questions coming up here. Now is your chance. You can just blurt out a question if you like. Now is your chance. Everyone's shy. Shy people. We do have five minutes, um, and uh, I think now is probably a good opportunity to mention that we will be having um, a similar rollout event on Wednesday, um, featuring two different presenters on two different topics, so feel free to join us for that as well. Um, one of the speakers actually will be Daniel Levy, who asked, uh, who just gave his feedback um, now. Um, so yeah, if you haven't gotten that invitation, feel free to put uh, a message in the chat box and we'll um, let you know. Perfect, thank you, Teresa. Perfect. Um, and the, the, what's, what's the same between these two days is my presentation. So if you wanna tune in a little late, you can skip my part <laughs> and, and catch Nikki Mixon and Daniel Levy. And, Levy and um, Nikki Mixon is the other, uh, Deshili Mixon is another speaker for uh, Wednesday and she has an amazing uh, project that she, led at UN Plaza in San Francisco to build rats out of there. And without um, giving, without, you know, creating a spoiler here, I can tell you that the rats in UN Plaza were getting so well fed that they couldn't fit into the bait boxes where we had traps. <laughs> so, that's how bad it was. So uh, that's your teaser to uh, check out uh, Nikki Mixon on Wednesday. So looks like we're, um, I don't see any, let's see. Do we get CEUs? No, we don't have continuing education units for these presentations, I'm sorry. Uh, at least not well, for- We do get part, continuing part education, ed. Chris. This is continuing education. This is much yes. more continuing especially if you guys give us some feedback in those little forms that, that Chris and I designed so meticulously. Just fill something out, send it back, make this document live. It's up to you. Absolutely. I'll make, I'll make sure to connect with Jen um, and Chris to make sure that we send you a follow-up email to everyone who attended with the different links for feedback and then more information about Rescape if you're interested in attending one of our trainings and keeping in touch with all of us. And, and Teresa, I'm not sure. I, I, when I said there's no CEUs, I was really only speaking about Department of Pesticide Regulation CEUs. I don't know if this qualifies for the, uh, um, the Rescape um, it can, program. can rescape CEUs are self-reporting. So if you'd like to um, self-report this 90 minutes um, towards the required three hours, I know there are a couple of you on the call today. That would be great. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, Casey, I, I think. I, I, unless this is actually a question for Casey Dos Santos Allen, rat birth control. Um, oh, rat birth control. That's a whole other topic. Um, uh, <laughs> that, I, I suppose you, I guess you could call that prevention, couldn't you? 
<laughs> it's not something that's in the guide. Uh, there is a, a, a product out there now, uh, I believe by Cinestech, that that's a really is a contraceptive for rats. We're we're piloting it in some piloting it in some of the parks in San Francisco. Some other agencies are piloting it. We don't know yet how effective it really is. It's not an easy one to measure because you have to have take into account that you might be using it in this plot of land, but your neighbor might not be. And so, um, uh, but that is that is one of the tools that our IPM program is experimenting with right now. Great tool. However, we're concerned with design. So in yes. this presentation, yeah. our goal yes. is to get all, all of us that do design to um, consider, as Daniel said, the maintenance aspect for sure, but also potential pests down the road. So um, as exciting and fun as it is to contemplate all the ways to um, eliminate pests and reduce populations, didn't prevent them. This is about design. How do you design things to prevent them? That's our, that's our goal. We're trying, we got some good designers in the crowd, I see. With that, uh, I'm going to wrap this glorious event, uh, wrap it up. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, please, we welcome your feedback on the guide. Take a look at it. Let us know how it can be improved, what's missing. Um, and for those of you who want to join us on Wednesday, we look forward to seeing you then. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.